without further ado, I'm excited to introduce to you the man, the myth, the legend, Oscar Villalone, managing editor for Ziziva. Make some noise for Oscar of the year NC. Thank you. Thank you all for, uh, uh, for coming out. Um, we have uh, five folks uh, who are in the new issue, this issue 123, what we call the poetry issue, uh, uh, reading tonight. All of them uh, wonderful uh, writers and, uh, and authors in their own right. And I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure their books are probably here once they move all those stacks and everything around here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you don't get an issue tonight, or you want to get a copy of the lovely 123, get one of their books. I think they'd be okay with that. They'd be, they'd be totally fine. And if you and if you corner them, they'll make you know make them sign it. And that's the because <laughs> you're not gonna get them one on one like this. You see what I'm saying? Otherwise, it's thirty people ahead of you tonight, maybe two. So that's not bad. Okay. Uh, 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 and one more thing too before I, I introduce our first reader. Um, uh, this is also kind of nice for us too. It's the first time we've gone out since uh, we won this Whiting Literary Magazine Prize. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big thing, man. It uh, and I was, uh, was telling folks a little bit earlier that um, you know they kind of call you a little bit ahead of time. They, they give you a phone call. They're gonna let you know, like, hey, don't tell anyone. Uh, but here's the thing: uh, when they send us an email saying, "Oh, we, uh, we need to talk to you," uh, I, I I I I email Laura. So I think we screwed up the application. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure we screwed up the application. It's like, well. What do you think it was? Like, I don't know. It's probably maybe we maybe didn't do something right with one of the spreadsheets or something. Well, let's just see what they say. Uh, and then, you know, maybe hopefully you can make it right. And uh, maybe we'll get, who knows? Probably won't help, but let's just get this fixed and then let's see what they say. So that was a complete surprise when they say, oh, no, actually, you're going to get this. Yeah. Yeah. But that tells you we're our headspace. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we flinch a lot now. We flinch a lot. All right. Uh, for our first reader tonight uh, is Colin Winnett. Uh, yeah. Colin is the author of Revelation, Animal Collection, Fondly, Coyote, Haint Stay, and The Job of the Wasp, which was an American Booksellers Association indie next pick. His novel, Users, is forthcoming from Soft Skull Press, which I believe has published all the uh, uh, the other ones. Am I, am I correct? Just a lot. one. In February 2023. Well, what other February would it be? Would you please give a warm welcome to Colin Winnett? Thank you, Oscar. Uh, okay. I was going to test it negative just a minute ago. Right. I'm clean. I have a brief window of non infectiousness. Um, and I was going to wear it, but then I made the very ill advised decision to put a blanket shirt on before I came in here. So I'm just like broiling. Um, but yeah, congratulations so much on the Whiting Award. It's such an honor to get to celebrate with y'all and my first appearance in Zizva, which I'm very, um, very happy about. Uh, and here at the Booksmith, which was my first job when I moved to San Francisco. Um, so that's, that's very special to be here. Um, I will kick off the poetry issues reading with a piece of fiction. Um, this is an excerpt from the story uh, called Ornament. And... Um, there is an enormous spoiler in the section I'm going to read, so spoiler alert, I guess. Um, Chris's mother died in a hidden second. It was like a skip in a record. How do we end up here? And soon Chris and her friend from before were drinking another bottle of rosé, and her friend was saying how strange it all was. She just couldn't believe it, just like that, saying, it's hard to live, and even harder to live on. And Chris lived her loved her friend. She truly did, but their conversation was making her feel nauseous. She felt like the sidewalk was tipping away from her, though she'd only had two large glasses, so she kissed her friend and said she needed to leave, to walk, to think about her mother, who had always been so difficult to live with and so overwhelmingly tender and loving that Chris had grown up never knowing exactly how she was supposed to feel knowing only that love came at a price and wasn't easy and was always uncomfortable and was never exactly what you wanted, never perfect, but was always there, always available to you if you were willing to accept it, to run out and meet it. And she was willing because more than there, love could be deeply satisfying, satisfying in a way few things ever were, all anyone could ever really ask for from life. The reason, in fact, to live the connection that granted a sense of purpose to whatever horrible things were going on in your life. And Chris could still feel the stink of her mother's home clinging to her clothes, her arms and legs under her fingernails, the 
she'd bathed and pruned and bathed, so she kept walking, looking for different ways to smell for so long that she'd completely lost any sense of where she finally, where she was when she finally texted Jim, who had stopped texting her two weeks ago, but who responded almost immediately, and she told him she was sorry, but she had an excuse, and would he meet her somewhere right now or as soon as he wanted, and he proposed the karaoke bar where they met, and she called a car, and soon Jim was telling her jokes and ordering drinks, and clerk Chris blurted out that her mom had died, let's just get that out of the way, and Jim was very sad for her, and he asked her several questions about her mom until Chris couldn't stand it any longer and asked him to sing with her, so they sang a duet and tried to ham it up. So you had a little trouble in town, now you're keeping some demons down. But Chris started crying instead of singing, stop dragging my, stop dragging my, stop dragging my heart around. And Jim signaled for the bartender to skip the song and walk Chris to the bar and tried to talk to her. But Chris had turned mean and something in her wanted to pinch his neck until his throat collapsed like the hollow Christmas ornament in the shape of a small present she'd crushed in her hand for no reason, just because she'd become overwhelmed one night while looking at it and had taken it off the tree and closed her hand around it, which her mother had discovered under a wad of paper towels in the trash can, at which point her mother had started crying because the ornament was from a small set of cheap garbage ornaments her own mother, Chris's grandmother, had left her, or had left in the trailer where she died, where Chris's mother had found it and had become overwhelmed with memories of being a little girl and hanging these cardboard fragile pieces of thin crappy cardboard crap on a fla fake plastic Christmas tree when she was only a child, only a little girl, which wasn't a particularly good time in her life or a particularly good memory, but was one of many memories Chris's mother carried around with her and brought out all the time like someone with a box of old audio equipment they were they're hoping that will someday somehow be useful to someone and her mother had cried with such intensity upon finding the crushed ornament under all those paper, ta paper towels but then had only asked Chris what had happened had only wanted to know the story or if there was a story and Chris had told her her mother she had no idea what had happened at which point her mother realized exactly what had happened and saw 100 percent and completely through chris's lie but instead of saying anything about it she had only tugged at the edges of the hollow christmas ornament trying to coax it back into a box-like shape before hanging the lopsided cheap thing back on the christmas tree toward the middle of a hidden branch where you really had to look to see it which was her mother's own unique brand of kindness hanging it in a hidden place but still hanging it and the two of them had never spoken of it again, never mentioned it. And Chris had never said anything close to I'm sorry, though she felt very sorry and knew. She absolutely knew she had seen it in her mother's eyes that her mother knew the truth and had only wanted to talk with her daughter about it, not even to understand it, just to have it verified and discussed and autopsied like they did with every other feeling they ever had late into the night, crying and talking, crying and talking about when her mom's mom had locked her in her bedroom for 36 hours so she wouldn't go completely insane, or when Chris thought she was pregnant but it had only been ovarian cysts she then had to have surgically removed, as well as all the much smaller and much less important things they'd held up and worried over, all those endless conversations, like one long conversation with increasingly fraught timeouts, which Chris had come to enjoy in their own right and to even feel grateful for at certain times in her life, but which, way back then when she was 12 years old and crushed her mother's mother's ornament for no discernible reason she had on wanted only to avoid and to never repeat again to never experiencing to never experience anything like those conversations ever again especially then when the only point would be to lay the obliteration of that ornament out between them so they could identify whatever dark destructive hateful impulse had led chris to mo ah, chris to crush her mother's shitty cheap cardboard ornament in her bare hand like a shitty idiot teenager. And so she'd said less and less to Jim as Jim said more and more. And soon he was checking his phone and talking about how late it was and what was she doing after this? And maybe she wanted to come over. And when she said she didn't know and tried to leave it at that, he'd set his hands, not even on her knee, but aggressively high, almost to her hip, exactly where her phone would have been if she'd kept it in her pocket like she used to do before she started to feel old and like she needed clean seam lines and a smoother, tighter look to her jeans, like she couldn't even just be anymore couldn't even look, couldn't look casual anymore because casual for her had become monstrous and good meant made up done up worked on the kind of look she used to laugh laugh out loud with her friends about whenever they saw it on someone else like she's trying so hard just let it go just be you but chris's you was now a person that people looked past and talked over and talked through and did not pause for and were not interested in she was no longer arresting. She was no longer what she'd never even wanted to be. And she was finally starting to notice it. And Jim was shifting and asking if he'd done something wrong. And the truth was he hadn't. He was perfectly fine. But the more she looked to him, 
like the way she felt, the more uncomfortable he seemed to be, which was very off-putting to her, if understandable. And then he was gone, some excuse or another, and she was alone, finishing both of their drinks and realizing that she didn't know him at all, and maybe he was an asshole, and how could someone just leave you? But also, she was being a drag, too. She wasn't ready to be out. She knew that. She didn't want to entertain anyone. She wanted to feel this very weird way she felt, which was sad, but also angry and full of music and very, very alive and like her skin hurt, like it burned a little, but was also electric and the hair on her arms was standing up under the chilling air of the AC and the night wasn't over and she wasn't a mess but in fact was made up done up worked on by herself and there were other people glancing her way and the night was young and though the bars were closing and there was plenty to do and plenty to feel who cared if she had to hold her breath all night hold it in and hide her feelings beneath a face that created possibility that opened the world up to her so she could step through herself into all the strange and unpredictable corners of the endless explorable map of life and soon she was in the bathroom touching a wet towel to her neck trying to blot out the red and realizing she didn't care and she was going to sing all right colin very nice sir do you, do you need water yeah as a towel Give that man, rub down his shoulders a little bit. Well, thank you, Colin. Thank you so much. Um, our, uh, yes, it is actually, it is a poetry issue. So, of course, we had someone start off with prose. Um, uh, well, okay. Well, anyway, um, let's, let's, we'll, 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 we'll make up for that right now. Um, our next reader uh, is, uh, is a wonderful poet and essayist, Heather Altfeld. Uh, her two books of poetry are Post Mortem and The Disappearing Theater. Her work is featured in the 2019 Best American Essays, Orion Magazine, Eon Magazine, Zizwa, Narrative, and others. Uh, she teaches in the Department of Comparative Religion and Humanities in the Honors Program at Cal State University. Chico, would you please give a warm welcome to Heather Altfeld. Just a tad, thank you. Also, newly tested. Um, thank you for having us. And um, I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't uh, live up to your expectations of coming down from Chico tonight. Yeah. We, we're, we're staying in the area for a little bit. So uh, Oscar mentioned I teach in the Department of Comparative Religion and Humanities. And um, for the past five, four years, I've been teaching a class called The End of the World. Uh, I just finished teaching it, and actually, the first time I taught it was right before COVID. Um, so, uh, it, given given what I've learned by teaching this class, I can tell you that in, in any group of roughly thirty people, there's at least one prepper. Look around you. Um, so this is for you, <laughs> and it's called the Apocalypse Club. Let's face it, the end of days titillates as well as any good porn. Nothing arouses quite like the thought of strewn bolts and broken joists, the severed tendons of the George Washington Bridge, the arm of God wrung and snapped back into the socket in the sky. Is there anything as hot as you, dressed as a doomsday pinup with a round of ammo strapped to your chest? for popping squirrels or the looters drinking from the slushy machine? Is there anything so delicious as the idea of whistling taps in the embers while administering bandages to the masses as though in life you had been indispensable? The heavy prepping is delicious as foreplay. The collection of beans and iodine, space blankets and dried ramen, the arrangement and rearrangement of brickwork in the cellar to hide the magazines pinks up your gray and beefy heart. So start a campfire and fall asleep until the forest burns and the animals run and the trees split down the center and the bees sizzle in their hives or drive a cannon disguised as a car into the Bohemian Club and run, run, run. 
Then bring out the hatchet for chopping wood or splitting the skin of an old horse for jerky. Bring the little mirrors used to start fires or check the sharpening of your lower jaw after bit weeks of lean bits nod for sustenance. Bring the powdered milk and canned sardines and love you buried beneath your house years ago. Because there's nothing like the bait of a good apocalypse to make you feel relevant to the one you loved, the one who left and did not call or write all those long years, the one who will return, crawling with her apologies through the rubble and the ruin to sip at the last of your tinned juice. Your first crush was the one you had on the whole world, its trilobites and its rose quartz, the pewter soldiers who seemed to sprout from the mud. You were part of something grand back then, and it was as if, for a little while, you'd meant something to it, as if the whole world had been in love with you all of its life. Thank you. <clears throat> Just occurred to me, these are both sort of weirdly on religious themes. Um, uh, this is uh, called Mysterium Trem Tremendum. It's from this issue of Zizava. And um, the title comes from uh, Rudolf Otto's book, The Idea of the Holy. And he is trying to define what he calls the numinous. And he talks about it as being three parts. It's silence and terror and then merciful gratitude which I thought was really cool. Um, it, I thought it was so cool that I started a poetry club and we call it Mysterium Tremendum. We have our own t-shirts. <laughs> We're very elite. We will only let the prepper in. No, um. <laughs> Mysterium Tremendum. Go into the thing you are most afraid of. Screaming, the body of a child burned. Go into it. It is a mother left over, a vessel of emptiness. Further, it is emptiness itself. Is that emptiness inside you? Isn't it inside everything? How does this emptiness make you feel? Quiet, everything important is missing. So would you call it silence then? No, that is a different language entirely. Do you speak it? Where I am from, it is no longer spoken. Tell me, do you hear things? I hear wind, rain, the voices of rocks. Do you see things? I see the veins inside mountains, the plate of the sky, grasses that tremble. Do you see yourself in those things? No, I see beauty. What do you feel right now in your body? A kind of noise. It will not go away. Where is it? It lives just behind my eyes. What does it feel like? A child crying. Is that child you, then? No, it is not. It is something that enters me. Is it passing through like a visitor? No, like a child through a mother. Your mother? No. Have I touched something sad? This sadness here, it appoints me. Should we ask it to leave you? Please take it away for a while. Can it be swept away with love? Can it be swept away with love? Thank you so much. Thank you. Heather Alfeld, thank you. Uh, one more time, yes, for Heather. Um, For the record, I am not a prepper. <laughs> but if I was a prepper, I'm certainly not going to tell any of you. That's <laughs> because when the apocalypse comes, the last thing I want getting out there is that I have a closet full of MREs, iodine tablets, and body armor. That's not for you. If I was a prepper, I'm not saying I am, but if I was, I'm not telling you. 
it defeats the whole point. Uh, let's go back to a little bit more uh, prose. Um, our next reader is uh, Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Uh, yes, her first. Yeah, please give it. Uh, Ingrid's her first novel was Fruit of the Drunken Tree, which was the silver medal winner in first fiction from the California Book Awards and the New York Times Editor's Choice. Her memoir, which just came out, is The Man Who Could Move Clouds. Um, and uh, she was recently named, is this correct? Visiting Professor of Fiction. Is that is that right, Ingrid? Yes. Yes, at MFA at, at the MFA at the University of San Francisco. Um and uh, she has some very uh, lovely, um, uh, I guess we, they're short prose pieces, but I think that they're rather lyrical. Uh, would you please give a wel warm welcome again to Ingrid? Hello, everyone. Um, I also just want to point out that um, this is issue one, two, three, which numerologically, it, it just feels like you should get it. That's what it feels like. Um, so yeah, so I write these short shorts and they, I, whenever I'm writing, I, I have a day of writing. I just, I try to write something short and usually they, they are born and they, they're born and that's how they are and that's how they stay or they, they're born and then I just, I erase them immediately. Um, so these are two that were born and, um, and I kept. Uh, one is called Isolation. He was a boorish man, boorish with his communications and boorish with matters of the heart. He practiced reticence. The less he said, the more others said. In this, he treasured like a waste of gems. At some point, people always retreated, walked back their affection. He often lost people. He concluded they were prone to lying and betrayal, and he shut himself further, up into his rooms, in his house, in the mountain. He didn't want to return the small number of messages that still came, and he would never send one of his own, lest he by mistake reveal something soft and vulnerable, which would leave him feeling ever more soft and vulnerable if and when people eventually left and betrayed him. It was safer higher up the stairs, in the attic in his house in the mountains, where the internet signal was weak, and therefore he could say that the text that never lit up the screen of his phone were not coming through because of the faulty internet connection. He felt much better this way, alone and unreachable, and if he was ever lonely, which he could for sure say he never was, he had the memory at the ready of people who a long time ago had once wanted to reach him. Uh, and uh, yeah, this other one is called uh, Husbands. At the bridge, Nate shoved me toward the abyss as a joke, then quickly grabbed me and pulled me back. He had laughed about it, hard, slapping his knee. Your face, he had said, then cackled again. I never understood what had been so funny. I didn't get which part was the setup and which the joke. Was the haha -ha part him pushing me or him pulling me back? I once heard that the person most likely to kill you was your husband. I actually heard it first for myself, as I told my friend Viviana, who was also married and whom I had wanted to protect by entrusting her with this information. I also told Viviana, we can't trust men. And sometimes I have to get out of the house. I am sure Nate is going to kill me. Nate was the most mild-mannered man, and still I could see the possibility. All men lived with a pile of aggressions not acted upon, but one day they would. Viviana and I loved our men less because of their imminent violence. We lit our cigarettes and drank back beers at the corner bar equidistant from our apartments in the Castro, away from the men, who knowing they'd been excluded got together at Viviana's to play board games. How boring, we said, making fun. One day they're playing board games, the next they kill you. Viviana and I enjoyed each other and hated our husbands. Though in a few months, Viviana will betray our understanding and she will get pregnant. And then she'll change her whole tune. Not only will she trust her husband, but call him her protector and provider. And it's like she's been abducted and brainwashed. I won't know who she is anymore. But for now, as we are together in the dark of night, we laugh, clink our beers, yell salud, 
we've survived our men once more. Thank you. Uh, and I did uh, want you to, to, to read uh, from like a short chapter um, in the memoir. So I do like enjoy like writing like these very short, quick things. Um, and so the memoir is about my uh, grandfather who was a curandero um, and that's a uh, mestizo medicine man and people said that he could move clouds. Um, so this happened, so this is, yeah, so this is memoir, this is true. And this happened the night that he died. Um, and we called my grandfather Nono and my grandmother Nona. So this is about a dream that she had that night. Mud. Uh, in dreams, Nono appeared to Nona and made love to her in her bed. It wasn't their matrimonial bed. That one she'd taken many decades ago to the witch who had split up Nono and his new love. Nona had wanted the witch to help bring Nono back. The witch had said the matrimonial bed possessed a magic not even a man like Nono could resist. The witch kept Nona's mattress for seven days. After retrieving it, Nona waited a year, then lost faith Nona would ever return. She waited for night, then dragged the mattress up into the wild jungle, alone in, in her nightdress, as far as body and rage allowed. When she looked up, hair plastered against her face, locusts rattled at her from the grass. She left their mattress there, deep in the forest, for the beasts and elements to tear apart. My mother had bought Nona a new mattress since that night, and in Nona's dream, it was on that current queen-size bed that Nona flooded her with pleasure, boring a pathway back to a softness in her she thought how long curled up and died from the hurt of his leaving. He brought her back home to her body through his body. After the throes of lovemaking, Nona looked at her. There were the spots of hazel in his brown eyes she knew so well. He apologized for all the suffering he had caused her. He begged. Nona had always wanted him like this, supplicant before her, desperate for something only she could grant. And so she grew cold, and drunk with power, she denied him. The next day, when Nona woke up, there was dirt all over her sheets and mud in her underwear. That was how Nona knew that overnight her strange husband had died. She did not cry, she would tell everyone. Now I know what it's like to make love to a ghost. Thank you. Ingrid Rojas Contreras, thank you. All right, this is the this is the portion of the evening where you just go full on poetry. So if you're not okay with that, you, you should leave now. Uh, our next reader, our penultimate reader, is uh, Troy Jollimore. Troy, where are you? What are you? I can't see. Oh, thank you. There you are, sir. Yes, Troy Jollimore. Its poetry's collections include uh, Earthly Delights. Syllabus of Errors, and Tom Thompson and Purgatory, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. His poems have appeared in The New Yorker, McSweeney's Poetry, Ziziva, among other publications. And he is currently a professor in the philosophy department at California State University at Chico. But the, again, they did not drive down from Chico. They came from Marin. Would you please give a warm welcome to Troy Jollimore. Came from Marin, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Oscar, oh, I get to take my mask off. I also, yes, I'm a member of the Negative Club, which is pretty awesome. Oscar always invites people to leave just before I come up to read. I don't know what's with. <laughs> I've been meaning to ask it's you about that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Fair warning. I, people appreciate it. Yeah. This is called. So I'm going to read two poems. This is from my most recent book, Earthly Delights. Uh, which the title comes from the title of a poem, The Garden of Earthly Delights, which was also in Ziziva a few years back. Uh, and that poem's a little too long to read, so I decided not to, but um, yeah, but if, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna read a shorter poem about a poem. Every one of us has one of these poems, and it's called The Poem You Will Not Live to Write. The poem you will not live to write. The poem you would have written if only you'd had one more month one more day, one more hour, is a killer. 
a no holds barred balls out masterpiece the one where you put it all together everything you learned everything you suffered all the bits of being human you spent your life gathering up it's the poem you've been waiting for all your life the poem you will not live to write the next poem you would have written after the last poem you will write which is it must be said a perfectly decent unexceptionable unexceptional poem the sort of poem you would have read in some magazine or other had someone else been the author or made it through the first half anyway and then maybe turn to the theater reviews or the gossip column or else just put the whole tiresome issue aside is let's just admit it a knockout there's no avoiding the fact the poem you will not live to write is the one that would make the grocer's daughter come back to you it's the poem you'd wear like a pair of expensive stolen shoes to a wedding you weren't invited to it's the one that waits for you in the dark unseen in the underbrush just outside the campfire zone of protected light with nothing but an uninhibited passionate kiss and your death on its mind thanks this is really nice i want to say just people and books in a room physically present I've missed this. I'm sure all of you have missed this. Uh, I see old friends. I see Doug back there. Hey, Doug, how you doing? It's great to see you. This is so nice. I love it. I'm so glad we get to do this again. Um, so this is the poem that I have in this very cool recent edition of this prize-winning journal. Um, well done, folks. That's awesome. Uh, and it's sort of a poem. I don't know. It, it, to some degree, it's, it's my attempt to describe what it's like to be around right now. I guess that to some degree, maybe every poem does that, but maybe more so with this one. Uh, it's called Closure. You might write a poem that begins with the words, I don't even know. You might write a poem that ends with the words, do I wake or sleep? They might be poems I go back to again and again when the headlines are bad, when the coffee is weak, when the guitar strings go on strike and refuse to sing and instead croak, thunk, groan, and buzz every unsong-like sound, every pained and unlovely, unmusical gesture. Somebody said to me not long ago, you need closure. And I wanted to pick up the nearest croissant and use it to smack him in his stupid face. <laughs> maybe when he said closure, I heard enclosure. Maybe fence, maybe pen, maybe I heard prison. Maybe I heard get over it you insufferable wimp, you intolerable milksop. Maybe I heard the clomping sound of my own relentless heart tub thumping my time-stamped days with its beatbox rhythm. Maybe I heard the slow ozone drone of the cosmic heat death to come as foretold in grisly detail in the book of reparations. Full disclosure, I don't want things to end. And I have no desire at all to make peace with the fact that they do, that we end, you and I, and whatever we love, our lovers, our friends, those apricots and the tree that produced them, Keats's odes, even that croissant, which in the end I did not weaponize, but sat calmly and ate with a cup of house blend, with a little room, please, and enjoyed all of it, the whole show. It's finite. It's mortal. It all is. I know this. I get it. I realize that we are all bound for the gallows. Just don't ask that I approve. Just don't ask me, as Joseph Cotton says in The Third Man, to tie the rope. Fuck closure. Fuck calm acceptance. Fuck everything that resolves. There were lots of apricots this year, though not as many as the year before, and there will be fewer next year. Was it Samuel Beckett who said, when asked how he was, oh, the usual, worse than yesterday, better than tomorrow? I could Google it. I won't. If I do return again and again to those poems, it might be because I used to think I could see another world, just a glimpse of one from my bedroom window, which was, after all, quite high up. As it turned out, I was wrong. As for this world, it's a veil of tears, is the word on the street. A veil where nothing avails. A veil that's zoned for soul forging. A veil of perpetual trouble and anxious turmoil and ceaseless not knowing. A veil of just let me get through this day. 
a veil of just what the blazing fuck is going on. But you should have seen the harvest we reaped ten years ago, the tree sagging under its weight. You should have tasted the fruit. You should have heard the bird song run rampant. Why didn't you? Oh, fled is that music, that's right. Somewhere beyond, somewhere some distance beyond this little enclosure, whose wooden fence I designed and constructed myself. You should have known me back then. Anyway, it appears our order has arrived. Do we slake or weep? Uh, thanks so much. All right, Troy Dallimore. Oh, this is going really well. This is really nice. Um, not that I didn't think it was not going to be nice, but you know, you never know. I mean, this is very nice. Thank you. Yes, I, it, I'm. Every day that I wake up, I'm shocked. I'm still here. Um, our final reader for the evening, boy, she's good. Um, is uh, Victoria Ching. Her new book of poetry is. The tree, the, excuse me, oh, this is what happens when you don't have your glasses, uh, is The Trees Witness Everything from Copper Canyon Press. Her nonfiction book, Dear Memory, uh, was published by Milkweed, uh, I think just last year. And Obit, uh, which was published uh, from also from Copper Canyon, but I think a couple of years ago, received the LA Times Book Prize, the Annisfield Wolf Book Award in Poetry, and the Penn Volker Award. She lives in Los Angeles. She actually flew up for this. God bless you, Victoria, and is a faculty member within Antioch's uh, wonderful low residency MFA program. Would you please, please give a warm San Francisco welcome to Victoria Chang. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to leave this on. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah? You want to? You want to raise it? Yeah. Yeah. You're like the microphone fairy. Thank you. It's a real job. You're so good at it. Okay. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks to the other readers. It's been so nice to be um, in a space with you. Um, thanks to Viziva. I'm just going to read. So, yeah, I was just going back and forth about what I should read because um, the essay in here is a bit long. So I'm going to read just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of it at the end. Um, so anyway, I'll just read some poems, okay? Mm -hmm. So I will read um, a poem from my book, Obit, and um, they're shaped, some, some of the poems there are shaped like little obituaries, and my mother passed away in 2015 of, of pulmonary fibrosis. It's when your lungs harden and you suffocate to death. And uh, my, my father had a stroke um, a long time ago, and he also passed away. Grief. As I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning, I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The text kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. So I'll read a few tiny poems. These are like little miniature, miniature poems that vary in length between like three lines and five lines, seven lines. They're all syllabics. And um, they also actually use W.S. Merwin's poem titles as my own titles. Why, you ask? Um, you know, I was just trying to figure out how to get my own self out of my own way after writing a book like Obit. And so these are really poems about nothing. Well, they're actually mostly just poems in conversation with, I think, Merwin. So I'll just read a few of them. They're really short. Far along in the story. Once I sat in rain, opened my mouth to the sky. I yearned to be changed. 
but each drop was a small knife. At first I fainted, but when I woke up, all the ticking had gone, and all the centuries were one. My choices no longer hurt. Losing a language. We were born with a large door on our backs. When will we know if it opens? Let's see. I'll just still mourning. No mornings are still. The newly dead move the most. They force flowers to dilate. The gods. The fact that leaves can't be put back on trees makes me think that you do not exist. Provision. The field remembers the wet boots marching on it. The sky has scars from birds. The body knows the square root of desire, the cold nights of bandaging the great fires. The lovers. There is a wildfire starving on top of a lake. See how the water holds fire but cannot end it? We insist on love when all we want is mercy. Um, let's see, what else is in here? Oh, you know, maybe I'll read. I was looking at art all day, so maybe I'll read. I think in the back I have. Oh, I'm so disorganized. Yes. So there's a poem. Oh, I finished a book of the poems, acrostic poems. And those are, as you know, I'm sure, poems on art. And they're all on uh, Agnes Martin um, works which I just love. And so I'll just read you um, the last one in the book. It's called Friendship, 1963. If you've seen this, it's 10 by 10. It's gold leaf and it's in the New York uh, MoMA. It's beautiful. They're grids, so she's, she, does, she works with grids a lot. Friendship, 1963. I came to the city so I could see gold. When I arrived though, the leaves were gold too and I became confused. I called the front desk four times, an angel answered each time. By the third call, he ended with, talk soon. In the morning, a different man answered and I burst into tears. On 53rd Street, small children kept on running into me. A father yelled so loudly at the boy on the scooter that I thought he knew I was carrying death on my back. By the time I arrived at the museum, there was a long line. The bald man in front of me kept turning around to look at me. I could tell by his forehead that he could hurt me. When I finally found the room, I was the only one in there. Everyone else was below me, in the Picasso room. While I stared at the gold rectangles, two attendants talked about whether to work overtime and get paid time and a half. I wanted to tell them that there's no such thing as time, just time and a half. Sometime in the night, Etel Ednan had died. I had just seen her paintings the day before. The crowds were large, and I wondered whether our looking had accelerated her death. When I took a photo of Agnes's piece, I saw my dark reflection on the gold. I started counting the grids, but the bald man came up next to me. Suddenly, there were two dark shadows on the gold. I asked him to step away, but when he said no, it was Agnes's voice. Oh, yeah, you have to clap. Thank you. Um... Okay, so I'll just read a really tiny, 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 tiny piece of this essay because it's just so hard to excerpt. Um, I became obsessed with um, joy poems and trying to figure out what they were because I don't write them. And so I just wrote this essay about it and Oscar and both of you, Laura, helped me so much um, in terms of editing it. So um, I'm really just going to read the first paragraph, if that's okay, because you can buy it and read the rest of it. Um, okay, so, and I learned a lot in the process of writing about this, and you'll have to read the essay to figure out what I learned. It's called The Belief in Angels in the 21st Century, Joy in Poetry. And there are two epigraphs, which I'm not gonna read. Is joy compatible with poetry? How does joy manifest in poetry? As a writer who writes lately, at least, mostly into sadness and grief, I become curious about the idea of joy and joy in art, because I like to think about not only the things I'm inclined toward, but also the things I lean away from. Yet in a time of war, a global pandemic, racial injustices, and countless other suffering, I begin to wonder whether poetry 
specifically joy poetry, could serve an important purpose. But first I had to figure out what joy was and determine what a poem of joy was. The concept of joy is tangled with happiness, grace, wonder, delight, gratitude, and even ecstasy. In William Butler, Butler Yeats's poem, Meditations in a Time of Civil War, he uses a phrase, abstract joy, which seems to capture the difficulties of pinning joy down. Joy is often associated with religion and spirituality on the one hand, while paintings such as the swing um, or the kiss capture a physical experience of joy. And of course, there's Matisse's famous painting, La Danse, where five figures are holding hands while dancing in a circle. The figures are painted in a vibrant red against a sharp green background and a dark blue sky. Matisse painted La Danse in 1909 using just three pigments right from the tubes, blue, green, and red. The painting is considered a vibrant ecstatic ode to joy and physical abandonment, and some critics describe this painting as a whirl in ecstasy. But a gap exists between the hands of the two figures at the bottom of the painting. And I'll stop there because I could keep going, but you can read the rest of it in there. Thank you. Victoria Chang, thank you so much. Um, well, well, that's it. And uh, first, I just want to thank again all of our, our, all of our readers tonight, uh, Victoria, Ingrid, uh, Troy, uh, Heather, and Colin. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight and for doing this. Um, and I also want to say again, if you if you don't happen to have a copy, we have plenty of copies tonight. Um, they're selling them up front. You could buy one. And if you and if you already have a copy, please go home with the book. You'll be you. It's a win win. You'll be happy. Uh, will everyone here will be happy? And uh, and lastly, though, uh, regarding the uh, Whiting Literary Magazine Prize, I, you know, I, I think I, we told this to the Chronicle. I don't know if they put it in the actual uh, article, but. Um, you know, it's it really is a, a sort of like a team effort. In other words, um, it's not imperative to get these things. It's very nice to get outside validation. It's not completely necessary, but it's, it's nice. It makes things a little bit easier. But more important than that is that it validates our contributors because we're only as good as the people we publish. That's, that's just how it is. And we're only as good as our contributing editors. And uh, we're only, you know, uh, exist... Uh, because of our subscribers and because of people who donate and the people who buy copies of, of Zizava. It's, it's all one thing. So really it's, it's nice to get that because what it tells us is that uh, this thing we're doing, we should keep going. So anyway, thank you very much all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Oscar, and thank you, um, everyone who read. And uh, gosh, thank you all for staying seated. This is exciting. Um, I'm not gonna like perform or anything. I just, <laughs> I just want to say that um, if you got a if you got a ticket tonight that you paid for, um, be sure to uh, redeem your little raffle ticket at the register for anything in the store. Um, uh, it's only good for tonight, so use it or lose it, baby. And um, uh, that's it. Actually, all the books that are in the store are for sale, so you could get any of them. <laughs> But um, but if you want um, any of the uh, authors who read, uh, we have their books at the register so that you can go straight to them. And um, there are copies of Zizaba there also. So um, one-stop shopping, you guys. Um, thank you, Zizaba. It's always a pleasure. And um, uh, to all of the authors who read tonight, y'all are amazing. Thank you. And um, thanks to y'all for coming. Hope to see you again soon. And now for the open mic portion. I'm just kidding. <laughs>